Kimpur. E está aqui por nós para partilhar uh, os melhores exemplos de ciência aberta na Universidade de Edimburgo. Uh, Hewan, thank you so much for uh, accepting the invitation to be here with Wikimedia Portugal and Nova uh, FCSH. It's very hard to say in English. Uh, FCSH is also not very easy in Portuguese, but in English it's tougher. Uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, well, thank, thanks everyone to, for coming along and for uh, for inviting me. Um, I'm just what I've done is I've tried to sort of condense all of the sort of sci open science and open research work that I'm aware of at the university, which is a big university, into one presentation. So there's quite a lot. So do feel free to put questions in the chat and. Uh, if I can, someone can keep me right when we're running out of time as well, so that I can sort of wrap up and allow time for those questions as well. So uh, th there's my email address on the screen. I'm on Twitter and we have a website that was created by students as well. Uh, that is at tinyurl.com forward slash wiki dash UOE, UOE for University of Edinburgh. So part one. Why does the University of Edinburgh have a Wikimedian in residence? What even is that? Um, well, as Catherine Marr, the former executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation stated, knowledge is alive and growing and it's most useful when it is used and not just static, but engaged with, built upon, expanded on. And when I'm looking up a term like open science, uh, I Google it and it, I'm given the definition from Wikipedia. Open science is the movement to make scientific research and its dissemination accessible to all levels of society, amateur and professional. Um, so when it comes to a, a research institution like the University of Edinburgh, search is the way we live now. With Google processing around 90% of the, the internet searches in the world, and you have the largest open education resource in human history, Wikipedia, being preferentialized in Google's top hits, then how knowledge is created, curated, contested, and disseminated online becomes of paramount importance to a research generating institution like the university that is looking to talk the talk and walk the walk of being able to share its research and fact check knowledge openly, and also be able to support its staff and students in developing 21st century digital research skills and a robust information literacy. Um, we have a vision that we think matches Wikimedia's vision as well, where our vision at the university is that our graduates and the knowledge we discover with our partners make the world a better place and that our teaching and research is relevant to society and we are diverse, inclusive and accessible to all. While Wikimedia have as their vision to imagine a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. So we think there's common cause from collaborating in a university context with the free and open Wikimedia projects. For us, it all started way back in 2014 uh, which is also when we had a Scottish independence referendum. Uh, and there was lots of conversations at the time, uh, a national debate at the time about how to make Scotland a fairer, better, more inclusive society. And this was also the year that our students association, USA, encouraged the university's senior managers to explore how learning materials could be made open, not only for students, within the university but across Scotland and the wider world. So the senior managers were challenged by the student association so they decided to come up with a OER policy that you can find out about at open.ed.ac.uk forward slash about. Our open education resources policy was approved 
in January 2016 and is informative and permissive in that it encourages staff and students to use, create and publish open education resources to enhance the quality of the student experience. And we have an OER service. Two members of staff, Lorna Campbell and Charlie Farley, help colleagues across the university make informed decisions about how to create and how to use OER. And this is our website. We think it's got the second best uh, web link after the Open University, um, but we've got open.ed.ac.uk and we create a lot of our open education resources on that. But it's not just two staff that support open practice at the university. We have myself. Uh, I'm going to just hide that video panel. Um, because my role is a multiple return on investment. If someone, if a university says they can't afford to invest in a Wikimedian, we say you can't afford not to, because it is a multiple return on investment in that it does support our key institutional commitments to open knowledge, information literacy, digital skills, and equality and diversity in that we are helping to improve representation online. And anybody can be a Wikimedian. Uh, my, I was recruited because I had a background in teaching. I was an English and media teacher who happened to also sort of like have library skills and some software skills, but it was primarily my teaching skills, the softer communication skills that I was recruited for so that I could converse with staff and students about some of the harder, more technical skills that they might be interested in, in learning how to do work with Wikipedia. Um, and my role is based in information services uh, within the university to support the whole university and to raise awareness of how Wikipedia and its sister projects work. And I design and deliver digital skills training events with that in mind. But I, I work with colleagues all across the institution, inside and outside the curriculum, to find ways we can benefit from and contribute to the development of the, this huge open knowledge resource. And here's me visiting different parts of the university um, at the, the Center for Regenerative Medicine, uh, where I worked with colleagues at the Center for Regenerative Medicine on improving Wikipedia articles related to Eurostem cells. And since I've been in post since 2016, I've worked with Wikimedia UK to uh, showcase a lot of the work that's being done in the curriculum in terms of Wikipedia in UK education. And we have this booklet that was uh, created in 2020 uh, that has 14 case studies, five of them from the University of Edinburgh, about how to engage with Wikipedia in the curriculum and the, the benefits that, that that yields for teaching, learning and the global open knowledge community. And that's a book that's now being updated with a further six case studies that will be available soon. So I'm going to pick out a couple of examples that I think are relevant to the topic of open science. And um, before I do, this is the instigator of the work we do at Wikipedia with Wikipedia at the University of Edinburgh. And in, in she believed that Wikipedians shouldn't just be in the library, they should be working across the whole university to support teaching, learning and research. So she believes that a hosting a Wikimedian residence has a real potential to target empowerment in learning technology. And we feel that Wikipedia is a an under-recognized form of learning technology to engage with, that if staff and students actively engage with it, it can support teaching and learning and our key institutional commitments, and as well as uh, supporting informed fact-check knowledge globally. And she says, if you put your Wikimedian alongside your other digital skill trainers and learning technologies, their impact can be significant. And with that in mind, we won an award from Open Education Global last week for Support Specialist of the Year. Uh, that was for me, um, but but um, I, I would like to point out that my students, I, we've hosted lots of student internships, 
And my student, Hannah, won last year the Student Award from Open Education Global because she spent all of summer 2020 creating short, about 20 short how-to videos for how to work with Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons. To And she's open licensed these and shared them to YouTube and pulled all the resources for how to simply engage with Wikipedia and its sister projects into one website that is tinyurl.com forward slash wiki dash uoe because we felt in the age of COVID-19 and remote and homeschooling that it was really important that educators, staff and students worldwide had the best quality resources for how to engage with knowledge and improving knowledge online. And Hannah, like other students that we've worked with, gets it. It's uh, the students are very motivated and to become knowledge activists. And as Hannah says, within universities, many staff and students are in excellent positions to contribute. They have specific subject subject expertise, so they could be valuable editors and empowered knowledge activists. And they are. Uh, we've worked with global health challenges online for the last three or four years where students collaborate in groups to evaluate short stub Wikipedia articles related to a natural or man-made disaster. So articles that are 200 words or less, and they, as a group, proceed to research the topic and improve each article's coverage by a thousand words, like, for example, the 2020 Assam floods. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also work with masters in public health students and uh, prominent academics like Professor Devi Sridhar, uh, where masters in public health students learn about public health articles uh, and how they're put together and contribute 180 to 200 words from recent review literature to establish a medical consensus before any information is then added to Wikipedia that they can be confident of improving that topic coverage. And a new study from the British Medical Journal concluded that enriching Wikipedia can be a very powerful way to improve health literacy. For example, edits to pages on topics like obesity are now being viewed 3,000 times a day on average. And there's that quote from the BMG, enriching Wiki BMJ, enriching Wikipedia content is a powerful way to improve health literacy. Reproductive biology, uh, the honours course programme is one we've worked with since 2015. So we've done about eight, seven or eight years now where students come together in tables like this and 90% of the students are female on that course. Um, so that skews um, Wikipedia's uh, gender diversity in that a lot of Wikipedia is edited by men about 90% of the time. But on this course, it's 90% female. And they come together every September to learn about how Wikipedia works and how other sources of knowledge um, related to reproductive health can be searched to improve topic coverage on Wikipedia related to re reproductive health. Um, so it, the number of students in the class changes every year, but it's roughly about 37, 38 um, on average. And what the course is like is the students come together and work collaboratively when they might not have had a chance to meet their other classmates prior to this. And we split the sessions into two, three hour sessions. And in the first, we have an academic support librarian come in and tell the students about best practice when using information from Scopus, Web of Science, Google Scholar, PubMed, and the library's search tool, DiscoverEd. And then they spend a week or two researching their articles before coming back and receiving Wikipedia training to then compile their article together. But importantly, they have to write their article with a lay audience in mind. They have to make the content jargon free and accessible. And the course leaders also find this is a really important skill for new medics because they don't often get a chance to write with a lay audience in mind. And here's an example of an article they've created. High grade serous carcinoma is one of the most common and most deadly forms of ovarian cancer. And it didn't have an article on Wikipedia 
until one of the students sat down and wrote it and made and she was scrupulous about making sure the information in that article was entirely fact checked and verifiable reliable from pub, reliable published secondary sources and there's about 60 references on that page and it's now received 153,000 views since it was published in September 2016 so communicating her scholarship and plugging an important knowledge gap online and she's even created her own open license diagrams to illustrate the article because she couldn't find any copyright free ones we also uh, have a commitment at the university to supporting a new data literate workforce to support scotland's growing digital economy where data is the new bacon um, as the t-shirt the shows. Um, the Scottish Government have charged the university to come up with 10,000 data literate graduates in the next 10 years. So Wikidata, uh, Wikipedia's sister project, is a great way for students to learn about data science and working practically with real world data sets. And so we work with design informatics students uh, the master's students come together for a data fair every October where they are pitched in three minutes. They get a, a data set pitched to them from the Scottish Government or the National Records of Scotland or the National Library of Scotland or a research data set from other universities. And they're pitched as projects and the students are challenged to come up with creative solutions and visualizations by the end of six weeks. So one of the key examples of the student's work has been with the Survey of Scottish Witchcraft database, which was a database that the university had in a very static MS access database. But the students turned it into linked, open, machine-readable data in Wikidata, and therefore we were able to create much more dynamic map visualizations to allow people all around the, in the world to further research and engage with this data set and develop more lines of inquiry. So course leaders on this course think it's a really important aspect of teaching data science that, it, that the students work practically with real world data sets and are able to analyze process, import and visualize data with Wikidata. And I like this quote uh, when talking about open data. Educators who make use of open data in teaching and learning encourage students to think as researchers, as journalists, as scientists, and as policymakers and activists. They also provide a meaningful context for gaining experience in research workflows and processes, as well as learning good practices in data management, analysis, and reporting. And that's my experience. Coming back to my colleagues, uh, Lorna and Charlie at the OER service. Here are a couple of examples of their work. Now, Lorna Campbell and Stephanie Charlie Farley are, are always happy to uh, provide advice and encouragement. They run digital skills workshops and events themed around OER and open education. They also provide support to all the university schools and colleges, and they provide advice, guidance and training on copyright and open licensing and support our ISG, information services, playful engagement strategy. We want to encourage playful engagement. Uh, some of the examples of their work is uh, they've worked with two PhD students um, on a SAT school project, which is an earth observation outreach program, which spans multiple university and research groups. And what they've done is they've developed some web-based open education resources and grouped them into modules on earth observation, data, biosphere, cryosphere, atmosphere, and oceans. And the two PhD students, Molly and Alyssa, adapted existing website content and they turned them into, adapted them into document form, mostly PowerPoint presentations, but also printable Word documents with the aim that such resources can be openly licensed and shared and made accessible to school to schools that ha both have access to Wi-Fi and computers but importantly these resources are now 
available to those schools that don't have access to Wi-Fi or computers. And they've been shared to TESS and the students also worked with the website's original authors to make sure they didn't lose the true meaning of the the the, the content that they were turning into these uh, documents that could then be shared as OERs. Um, the OER service also worked with Creative Edinburgh and on a, a project called Creating Edinburgh, the interdisciplinary city city. And it's a new Edinburgh Futures Institute course run by a chap by, called David Overend. And the idea is that the OER service are providing support and encouragement for how some of the student projects can be shared under open license. One example of this is the Lichen Walk, which is a project to raise awareness of the presence and importance of lichens in the formation of the urban ecosystem and their impact on our perception of the world. So the idea is to introduce inhabitants or visitors to Edinburgh to the fact that lichens are there in our urban ecosystem and that the cities aren't just human constructs, that other living beings colonize the surfaces and interstices of the city and to create this hidden wildness. So we have these project resources of the lichen walk available on an open license like the lichen walk map that will show you how to engage and where these lichens are and more about these lichens shared under a Creative Commons attribution share alike license. They've also worked uh, really for the last several years with Geoscience Outreach course, which is an innovative fourth year undergraduate course in the School of Geosciences, which aims to pro provide students on the course with an opportunity to develop their own science communication and engagement project. Um, the, what the project involves is the students on, on the Geosciences co outreach course work as a community partner where they take the role of as, as a consultant to an imagined community client and they develop a bespoke resource to solve a problem or need. But this resource has to have legacy. And for the course leaders, that was a key problem until they talked to Lorna and Charlie at the OER service. Because legacy was able to be provided by the students' resources being shared openly on an open license as part of our university open ed shop of resources. For example, you've got uh, a lesson plan on organic matter cycling. You have also an eight part, an eight part project about sea level change and climate change. And a four lessons on that provide an introduction to volcanoes, volcanoes and various aspects of geology as well. And by developing these OERs, um, the, the students on the course have built core important graduate competencies and transferable attributes that are going to be really useful um, when they leave uh, uh, the university and enter the world of work. And they, they're able to evidence that as part of this project. And they're, like I say, they are, their, prod, their resources do have had a legacy now in that they are shareable on the Open Ed website, but they're also shared on the TESS website as well for other educators and students to have a look at. And uh, the OERs on TESS have, there are 83 uploads to date, and there have been 33,000 views and 110,000 downloads so far. And so that is a legacy that the students can, and uh, my Open Ed colleagues can be proud of. And there's some examples of some of the, the resources that have been shared to openly and for free on the TESS website on marine ecosystems, environmental heroes, ozone and weather, and much, much more. And they've also been shared to YouTube um, uh, as another source of uh, legacy. And for this work, uh, my colleagues also won an Open Education Global Award last year for the best open curation repository for the open ed collection of geoscience outreach OERs. And if you want to know more about the work of our OER service, they've written a book that they've just published um, that is available in print form or digital form called Open for Good, 
which covers the first five years of the work of the OAR service at the university. Um, I've also contacted my colleague at Scholarly Communications, uh, Dr. Theo Andrew, who's provided this case study of open scholarship. He, uh, Dr. Theo Andrew uh, has been telling me about the power of preprints and in one particular case study related to Omicron, uh, as there were various headlines in the news around December last year, which reported the discovery that the Omicron variant of COVID-19 appeared to be much milder than the Delta variant. So research from the EVE2 study was carried out at the Usher Institute, and they only finished their analysis on the 22nd of December 2021, but they were very keen to get their results out openly in a transparent manner. So our scholarly communications team helped them to post their results in the University of Edinburgh's repository as a preprint. And then the press office contacted them to say that this was beneficial when the world's media descended on them to ask them for the underlying data. The reaction was quick to the preprint and reported by media like the BBC and the Science Media Center. And it then informed various national advisory groups like the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunization, who were then quickly able to read the research and fold it into their evolving guidance on boosters. So Theo's provided this up-to-date statistic. Um, in January, the preprint had tw 2022 the preprint, so that's only a month after the preprint was released, the preprint had 22,000 downloads, most of which were in the final week of December 2021. So 21,000 downloads in 10 days is a sure way of improving rapid communication where you need to have open research shared immediately. Uh, to date, there have been 34,000 downloads, and that compares to the corresponding peer-reviewed paper that the preprint turned into only having 16 downloads. Now, Theo thinks that may be a bit of unfair because the, the peer-reviewed article will likely be more downloaded from The Lancet, where it originally was published, but he still argues that preprints are a more effective means of dissemination than journals, and journals are perhaps only really wanted for university prestige. And the, the final point he makes is if the EVE2 project team had sat on their results and waited for publication in a traditional journal, then all of this activity would not have been possible. Another example he highlights is uh, the Uncover project, which is staff-student partnership led by the Usher Institute that was a, set up to conduct rapid evidence reviews of COVID-19 research in response to requests from policymakers. And the website is based on open source software and provides links to open access reviews and journal articles, in addition to open license educational materials and workshop resources for others who are conducting rapid evidence reviews. Some of the topics covered by Uncover include racial and ethnic variation in the COVID-19 risk factors and outcomes, the transmission and infectivity of COVID-19 in indoor and outdoor environments, COVID-19 in schools, and the use and effectiveness of face masks, face masks in different community contexts, and much more. So this brings us on to the last part, open research, because this is how the university thinks about this work. Now, we have taken a con conscious decision here at the University of Edinburgh to make use the more inclusive term open research rather than open science in order to underscore the relevance of the terminology across the whole entire university from whether you're studying physics or whether you're studying fashion it's open research it's not a binary either or situation but rather a continuum that runs from fully closed to fully open and what I've added is a link here to our Edinburgh Open Research Roadmap, which will guide our move towards open research as the new normal across all research disciplines at the university. And as an active member of the League of European Research Universities, LERU, 
we have based our roadmap on open science and its role in universities, a roadmap for culture change, which was a paper published by the League of European Research Universities in 2018. So our version of the roadmap continues our assess assessment of our progress against the 37 questions posted by Leru in their 2018 paper on open science. And we give details of the steps we are taking to move forward. Um, we've also held our inaugural open research conference in 27th of May, 2002, which was attended by 250 online and 90 in-person participants. And all of the presentations and slides are available on our journals.ed.act.uk EOR site. And the conference proceedings are also published by our new service, Edinburgh Diamond, which is a free open access platform for books, journals, wrote reports, and conference proceedings. But one of the most exciting developments of the university is a grassroots initiative, which is the Edinburgh Open Research Initiative. Uh, it's, a it's a grassroots collective of students and staff based primarily at the University of Edinburgh, but it's what it's aiming to do is promote awareness of and training in open research practices and policies and lobbying for these to be implemented and formally recognized by the University of Edinburgh. Now, if you want to know more about EORI, the Edinburgh Open Research Initiative, then William Cawthorne is a key person to get in touch with. And he's stated that there has been a tangible progress made on the EORI aims in that They've grown numbers to over 100 members on their team channels, Teams channel, and it's a very active space for discussing open research. They've organized open research, co the, the conference and symposium days. They've made open research more visible through their Twitter channel and through their seminar series. And they've provided a platform for university-wide support and communication to help build and share resources working towards open research through their Teams channel, their seminars, their open research conference. They've also wanted to have an open research ambassador as one, as the, of, one of their aims. And William was appointed as the uh, Leru Open Science Ambassador last year. And we now have other open science research leaders across the university. And what he says is what's great is that the University of Edinburgh now has staff dedicated to open research issues. So part of what we're doing is to work alongside them to support open research initiatives at the university. However, there's still much work to be done. Some of the challenges and opportunities that he's identified are that he thinks there's a fragmented nature of open research across the university. In one sense, it's great that there is so much grassroots enthusiasm from staff and students in that Teams channel, but <clears throat> he believes that the EORI channel has got a much stronger central forum for pulling all that work together. He also does believe that an opportunity would be to have open research as part of undergraduate and postgraduate education. And but that's uh, a desire and an aim for a future date that's not yet been rec formally recognized yet. And finally, <clears throat> um, we have a new open access policy as of January 2022. Uh, it's a groundbreaking, uh, we think, open access policy, which was the first in the UK to include a rights retention strategy. And this is a mandatory open access policy applies to all university staff members with a responsibility for research. So going forwards, as of January 22, all authors automatically grant the university a non-exclusive, irrevocable worldwide license to make manuscripts of their scholarly articles publicly available under the terms of a Creative Commons attribution license. An open license. We've been helping other universities like the University of Cambridge and the N8 group to introduce similar policies. And the N8 group, for those that don't know, is a partnership created in 2006 of the eighth most research intensive universities in Northern England, like Durham, Lancaster, Leeds, Liverpool, Manchester, Newcastle, Sheffield, and York. Um, the, so Theo's, Dr. Theo Andrews written a blog on the progress of, of the first nine months of this open access policy, but 
here's a little snapshot. This shows the current open access status of 2022 journal articles in the last nine months, where you have 5% are closed and 78% are on an open license. 3,519 journal articles published in 2022. So we're not just talking the talk, we're hopefully walking the walk and it's a walk we're liking or liken if you prefer. Um, and that's where I think I will stop. But if you want to find out more, you can ask the Open Education Service and uh, contact me through that email address as well, open.ed at ed.ac.uk. And I can also show you a video of some of the, the reactions of staff and students to end on, if we have time, that are also available at that short link, tinyurl.com, student vids. Yeah, I believe uh, we have time for the video. Do we have time or not? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. So I'm going to see if I, you can hear this. Can you hear that? Not really. No, okay. Let me try. And coming out. Uh... Oh yeah, share sound. Let's try that. What I think Wikipedia really stands out to me is that as I went through school, it was always a place where I can look up things. So um, I have the benefit of being able to that. read English Wikipedia, Danish Wikipedia, yeah, yeah, Norwegian yeah. Wikipedia, and sometimes German Wikipedia too. And um, Wikipedia was always basically the saviour when it was a word I didn't know, a term I needed to look up. Um, yeah, that's, that's probably it. So we all know that our students are using Wikipedia and we're all using it ourselves. Um, so I think that being familiar with it is really important and it's a really important part of information literacy and uh, digital skills and just uh, understanding of the um, resources that we and our students are using. Um, it's been really um, a really interesting and exciting experience for me because it's not something I've been involved with before but um, as a librarian I think it's, it's something really important to get our students using Wikipedia and contributing to it especially in medicine where it's often a first port of call for people for finding medical information so contributing to that is really exciting because the students can actually um, before they are doctors they can actually contribute to the medical knowledge base. You've kind of contributed to public knowledge in some way even if it's just repackaging knowledge that's already there but you're making it accessible and it's a really good exercise in critical thinking and that's something that um, you know sort of the ultimate skill you learn in an undergrad degree and and I suppose looking at it, yeah, learning to look at an article and think, how could this be improved? Um, and I think, and then finally, like, as a student, it's a really good opportunity and it's a really motivating thing to be able to do to relay the knowledge you've learnt from lectures and exams. It hasn't really been relevant outside of lectures and exams, but to see how it's relevant to the real world and to see how you can contribute and use your use your knowledge to contribute. I think what I found surprising was how easy it was, like the visual editor was really good. I thought I'd have to do a lot of like HTML coding or something, um, but it was really easy uh, to just put it in and do the references and stuff. Um, yeah, and I suppose the other thing was how like satisfying it was when it was done. Like I thought, you know, for comparing again to academic essays, like you send them off, you get the grade back, you look at the feedback and you really never really read them again. Whereas um, I suppose knowing that people are coming back to this article and finding it useful uh, is really like gratifying and you're just, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, it was, it was fun. It remains a massive resource for people to access and understand history. Um, and yet the history that people access on Wikipedia is often very different from the history that you would access in a university department. There's very little social history, there's very little women's history and gender history, uh, history of women of people of colour or queer history. Um, and the only way that's going to be overcome is if people from those disciplines start actively engaging in Wikipedia and trying to correct those imbalances. Because, you know, it is 
I'm sure people are fascinated by what sort of bullet was used in X sort of gun. Um, but I feel the social potential of Wikipedia to change people's perspectives on the world uh, really lies in correcting imbalances in their representation of the world. And that's a very long sentence with far too many long words. But basically what I'm trying to say is that people should try and make Wikipedia accurately represent the diversity of the world around us and the diversity of history and the diversity of uh, historical scholarship. Yeah, so I think there's definitely been a shift in terms of how people have viewed Wikipedia. So I think while it's still not widely cited as um, its own source for information, then I think it's really been gaining a huge amount of credibility in terms of a, a starting point. And a lot of the references that are contained within these articles are really reputable science publications and journals. But I think one of the strengths of Wikipedia is that it's making this accessible to a much broader and a much wider audience. So in terms of having that really good starting point, then it is a lot of people's first call now when it comes to learning about a new topic and sort of highlights or pinpoints some of the relevant literature. Yeah, I suppose another another dimension of that, I suppose, is, um, you know, what do we want a modern graduate to be? Um, and we're moving from um, a modern graduate thinking about um, sourcing information to, as Jenny mentioned earlier, this idea of critical analysis and critical thinking. So Wikipedia has sort of, I think, um, moved into this area of being a useful information source in its own right um, th there's a sense of increasing trustworthiness in that source i think mm -hmm. perhaps a lot of the lack of trust in the past was that oh anybody could go in and change it and then it wouldn't be true anymore but i think um it's it's kind of clear that there are such strong gatekeepers on, on articles that that ten it tends to be a reliable source so we're moving into a, a, a sphere now where wikipedia as a as a useful source and a reliable source uh, is more and more emerging to be the first step students go to before they go on to perhaps integrating that information with other information, using that as a leapfrog and so on. So I, I just think it's becoming more established as a aspect, an aspect of resource that students use in their, in their education. I also do think that where then Wikipedia has a really good space is that academia focuses way too little on how to communi communicate, you know, world-leading research to the layman people. I love the rap. That is why everyone. I that's why I love Wikipedia. I've always loved it. Like, you know, you click on one page and then five hours later you're still in like, you know, you start out it's like I don't know, World War Two history and you end up in like. I don't know how proteins are breaking down in your body and your leg. I don't know how I got there. And that's the end. <laughs> we have uh, a very, very uh, detailed question, set of questions from Katia on the chat. I don't know if you could uh, maybe help with that uh so what's that i'm just reading through it all so, um i'd like to know if you came to the university did you find a collaborative community or resistance in the different sectors um it's, it's an interesting one because Wikipedia in the academic sphere that hasn't always had the best reputation and it's almost become the epitome of everything that people think is wrong with the internet and the wild wild west of the internet and uh I think it what we found was that we had to get people in the room we had to because they do have preconceived wikipedia is 21 years old now so people already have preconceived ideas of wikipedia but they don't really know the mechanics of how it works or its scale its impact it's how many editors or are involved or whatever so you, what we found initially was we had to give people an excuse to come into the room and discuss these things and challenge me 
so we would try and run events when we thought academics could attend like in time times of the day that they might be able to attend or times of the semester or the breaks between semesters when they had more of thinking time that they could possibly come into the room and then they they could find out about how wikipedia editing works ask questions of a bit and i would fire back answers based on my understanding and invariably challenge those preconceptions and they would go back and there would be a little seed of an idea formed that they would and they would then get in contact with me a few months later once they'd thought about it a bit more and thought maybe there's something I could do in my own context and they would ask you sort of like tentative questions do you think we could do a, an assignment and so it's just a little what we we called it was open knowledge nodes we would create a network of open knowledge nodes and where we had positive experiences from staff and students that tended to beget other positive experiences and we'd actually get other academics talking to other academics like dr alex chow in divinity was able to give advice to a history of art lecturer who wanted to run a sort of similar kind of assignment to what he'd done previously so yeah it, it did i i think when you're talking about a, an, a community of thirteen thousand staff 13,000 staff and 37,000 students there are enough people that get it that you can sort of uh and then it starts to snowball and more just planting the seeds and being established over the last six I'm almost seven years into the role now so people are, are getting much more used to my being there and aware of the kind of activities that we do um so it has snowballed over time so i i would say there are some individuals that still are going to be always unconvinced but my experience is that, that a lot of academics are, are smart people and if as long as you provide them with uh, truthful answers they can they 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 they're able to sort of take that on board and work with you um what advice would you give for dealing with community resistance to adopting open science or open research practices uh hmm i i i don't know i, I think it's 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 on a context basis i don't know if there's a, a one big answer to that but we've got a lot of we've got about six or seven years experience myself lorna and charlie of being able to give sort of tailored advice um and I, I guess it would sort of like depend on what what the resistance was if there was genuine concerns about releasing material that they were worried about or they they just weren't able to they didn't see the benefit of going open and you if you're able to sort of like showcase some examples and we we always try and sort of like make sure all our examples are uh, available for people to see what's been done previously and the impact of that then th th that we're always trying to showcase and raise awareness of what we do and use existing platforms as well like university's got so many email lists and twitter feeds and forums for discussing all manner of topic so we would we would all all try and link in with existing forums where academics are already going to be and see if we could get like a five ten minute 15 minute space in an existing event that they were running anyway um and just sort of plant again plant the seeds and just say we, we are here to support you if you want to find out more here's our email address here's our examples um any other I'll, I'll, I'll take a pause if and see if there's any other questions any tips for student engagement uh, student engagement um they take they take a lot of their cues from the lecturers so if you can get lecturers on board the the students feel like it's legitimated 
Um, but I, I run an award as well called the Edinburgh Award, um, which is run with our careers service to accredit extracurricular volunteering that the students do in any number of different fields. So the students undertake 50 to 80 hours or maybe working with a charity or this student radio or something like that. But our award is, is digital volunteering with Wikipedia from vid 50 to 80 hours from October to the end of March. And they can research a topic that is maybe related to their course discipline and would complement their course discipline or completely separate. Um, and we're in our second year of that now, and we've had 43 signups. Um, so there's 43 students that are wanting to do about 50 to 80 hours of extracurricular volunteering on Wikipedia. And we, we, we sort of say, ask questions, collaborate with one another, um, but also ask questions of the academics because a lot of academics don't have a lot of time, but they're, they, they, they might know a Wikipedia page that needs improved related to their subject. So we actually have course leaders that will do a two or three minute video pitch. I think saying, I think you need to improve South American literature on Wikipedia because the page on Paraguayan literature is terrible. And they'll pitch ideas to the students and students are happy to, to do that. And, and also that, you know, you can also invite organizations like the national galleries of Scotland or to pitch ideas about stuff this, that needs improved on Wikipedia and students are willing to sort of like do that, but they also are looking for opportunities to make friends as well. And what we try and do is last year, I was, I was only able to support the award by Zoom. And a lot of the feedback we got that, that it was like quite sad that the, the students weren't able to make friends and meet up in person. So this year I'm organizing group research sessions in the library. And because the library is one of our key points, because not everything's online. That's the, the point that we're trying to get information that's maybe in print or in the archives out onto wikipedia stories that are missing particularly underrepresented stories and store and students are often motivated by fairness and underrepresentation so if you can show them black history is is missing or lgbt history is missing or gender history is missing or any any anything where they can see that this is scandalous i I need to do something about this. And also they love, they kind of love Wikipedia, the eccentricity of Wikipedia, you know, that you can have pages like death by coconut. Um, so we try and sort of like have group research sessions, get them to research topics they're interested in and feel proud that they're being a knowledge activist. We, we call them knowledge activists that they're doing and feel that they feel satisfied that they're publishing and filling a gap online. So students get it more, I think more than the lecturers in a way, but sometimes the, it's a mix of they, the students take their cues from the lecturers, but the lecturers also take their cues from the students as well and see that they are getting motivated by working on Wikipedia and that sense of pride, like reproductive biology students say, say it's like the British, great British bake off where there's a, a flurry of activity at the end of their research session, but they ultimately feel really proud that as a group, they've produced this piece of work that they can show off and it's there in Google for all time. So, yeah. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I don't know if there's any others or if that's, I was actually oh. going to ask what Katya then followed, which was the 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 open access policy. Like if, if I'm just going to read her, <laughs> her question because it, it's it's really what I hoped for. Um, if if there's any incentives besides the fact that it's now mandatory 
because I think we have kind of a similar uh, thing right now. The funding requirements for research require everything to be published in an open access form, but uh, I see that there's still a lot of uh, doubts about the, the whole process and about how it works and how they can do it. And I guess with doubt comes always a bit of resistance. Um, I think what the, the library team are doing uh, and they've written about this is that they they are working the library are working with professional services staff who are embedded in different schools and colleges and they're what they're doing is they're trying to provide a series of internal seminars and so they've reached an audience of about 1700 researchers which is about 21 percent of the total so far just to sort of give them awareness of the new policy and uh the benefits of it why they're doing it and how how they and addressing any concerns or questions so basically academic staff are informed about the policy and the support options that are available to them and they're also sending out all staff emails circulated by the college and schools about the new policy and guidelines and so they they feel that's kind of essential in spreading the message and getting widespread buy-in from the academic staff. So emails and internal seminars is what they're trying to do. But they also have to contact the publishers as well and let them know that they can't sort of introduce restrictive publishing agreements that have embargo periods and things like that. So there's it, but yeah, can put you in touch with Theo Andrew, our scholar, scholarly communications team, who might have some more advice. Um, but yeah, they, they, they've found that they've got widespread engagement with academic authors who have made 90% of their research outputs open accessed mostly within one month of publication. So yeah, I think they're trying to sort of take the authors with them. Thank you, Stephen, for uh, your answers. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, I think, I guess this is the hour up, but um, um, I'm always happy to answer any follow up questions. If you know, I've just added my email to the chat um, and I've added the website link as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and and yeah, uh, this this is really enlightening and, and inspiring, I guess, uh, for most of us who are working on open research, open science. And um, some of the, the, the people who are here today, they, they, they're on the staff. And so they're really pushing uh, for change. So I think it's really good to see uh, success cases like it's possible. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much, Ian. Um, yeah, no problem. And yeah, uh, as far as the uh, recording goes, uh, hopefully I will uh, we will put put it up on Wikimedia Portugal's channel, and then I'll share the link uh, with you uh, and with everybody in the in the room. So thank you so much, and have a nice day. Um, amanhã vai ver três anos do Wikidata na faculdade e no Zoom. Um, ainda se podem inscrever portanto basta passarem pela agenda da FCS se gastam aos links com a agenda completa e, e pronto, muito obrigada Thank you so much, see you soon Bye. Thank you, thanks everyone